All right, um, well, let's get a countdown. Okay, so three, two, one. Welcome, welcome, ladies and gentlemen. So we have a very, very special guest today. You guys will probably recognize him. The white whale, as we say, the big <laughs> one. <laughs> so <laughs> this is Grant Sanderson, uh, three blue, one brown. Mm -hmm. um, you guys probably are familiar with his animations um, on YouTube. Mm -hmm. um, he also has a website, uh, three, three one brown .com. Um And he also re recently has been doing live streams, quarantine live streams. Um, and yes, welcome. Thanks, Grant, for well, coming. Yeah, thank Thanks you, for Grant. Me on. We're, we're going to insert clapping noises and children and you know, reveling and <laughs> stuff like that. <laughs> thank you, kids. Thank you. Calm down. Calm down. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm sure you've helped a ton of undergrads in in your time of you know just making these animations and stuff so mm -hmm. this is the appropriate time for them to be clapping and uh, <laughs> <laughs> he definitely came around at a good time for yes. for us for sure oh yeah actually grant i i don't know if you remember i emailed you and i was saying that you basically got me through my undergraduate degree <laughs> oh wow i i don't believe that but I, i'm touched <laughs> your videos came couldn't have come at a better time exactly no I, I can I can recall certain moments where I just I was battling with a concept and I was like alright let me let me google this mm -hmm. and your video would come up and would be it would just be like you're like you just mind blown kind of experience I'm <laughs> speechless now but yeah it's it, those animations helped a lot we're going to go into a little bit of the the, the kind of philosophy behind all this but mm -hmm. before we go into all that we kind of wanted to get a sense of a background for all of our listeners of who you are you know what was your journey and path to um, making a YouTube channel or you know especially about mathematics so well I've loved math for as long as I can remember and this probably runs down to numerical games that my dad would play with me when I was little um, the one that always shines in my mind because of the positive associations is one associated with counting sugar cubes. Um, he'd put them in these interesting geometric arrangements. Um, I'm sure he also did a million other things, but that's sort of the, the one that I turned to in thinking like numerical patterns at a very young age and like positive associations there. And like you, you, as soon as you self-identify as liking something or even being a little bit good at it and you're like a young kid who's prone to ego, like you sort of think about it a little bit more and you like keep pursuing it. So by the time I was going to college, whereas a lot of other people might have had this existential angst about what am I going to major in? What is the future going to be? I was like, well, I don't know about the future, but like I know for sure I'm majoring in math. And um, I think at that time, if you were going to ask me like what the long-term path is, mathematician probably would have been high on the list. Um, mm. But I love communicating. I love like uh, teaching um, in various different capacities. And I think, you know, around that time, you know, let's see. So if I graduated in 2015, uh, that would mean that like during my undergrad years, that's really when like YouTube is maturing, right? It's not just like the the OG days of, you know, 2007 <laughs> YouTube necessarily, but it's very clear that there's like um, people who are both independent and yet very professional about what they do and go into a lot of depth, like Minute Physics was a very influential channel, I remember, um, and that you know, he just talks about things that are, you would never get on network television because all the producers would say, like, no one wants to understand, you know, the nuances of spin one half versus uh, whole number spin. Like, that, right. that's not going to go out there. But you just have millions <laughs> of people engaging with it in a meaningful way. Um, and so maybe pattern matching off of that or something at some point, I... Um, honestly, when I wanted a coding project and I just wanted to put together some, like, math animation framework... Um, like making a YouTube video out of it sort of seemed like a natural endpoint of like, okay, I'll make a lecture that I post to YouTube in some way. And around this time, um, Khan Academy put out what they called the talent search, which was, uh, they were just looking for more content creators, more people to add educational stuff to their site that wasn't just Sal Khan plowing away in his closet endlessly uh, yeah. making videos. And like, I talked to some of the people at Khan Academy and we really resonated and I ended up working for them for a bit. Um, all the while, still doing more animation, still doing three blue and brown stuff on the side. Um, and it, I think it was around that point that I, you know, I had originally been thinking of that time as being like a gap year or a gap year or two between undergrad and graduate stuff, which is not smiled on in like math department <laughs> worlds. That's not like a thing, uh, but I think yeah. it should be. Uh, but basically while I was at Khan Academy and like while I was seeing more, I guess, positive responses to three blue and brown, um, 
I just had a sense that like maybe there could actually be something to like just trying to explain stuff through the internet, right? Like the internet's only going to grow the university systems. I don't necessarily have like as much bullish confidence in to like throw my career path into them. Who knows what that looks like 30 years from now. Whereas like, what does internet outreach look like 30 years from now? It's like probably pretty great. Um, Mm -hmm. So slowly started pointing my vector in that other direction. Very interesting. So, um, And which university did you say you came from, Grant? I studied at Stanford. Stanford. Excellent. That's, yeah, that's really, really good school. And you still, and you chose to leave that, correct? Leave, like, I mean, I, I graduated from you Stanford. Graduated. From oh, you graduated. But, but okay. I didn't, I, did, I never actually started any graduate programs. Um, oh, okay. Yeah, so I never, okay, I never so actually, just, yeah. Okay, interesting. So... So which one, which one were you thinking about if you were going to go <laughs> to grad school, if you were like, oh, uh, well, I mean, if, if you're in the math world, it's like Princeton is the center of the universe. So th- that would be the Holy Grail. Um, I mean, I, the, the problem is for grad applications, like what's most important, I think, is that you have a strong relationship with your own faculty and like right. advisors who can like vouch for you. Um, and I think the biggest regret I have from my time in undergrad is even though I like I did well in courses, I feel like I understood the math well. I never really engaged with the faculty as well as I should have. Um, and in that way, like I actually I don't think I'd be super optimistic about like the I don't know, you maybe shouldn't care about like the tier of the school you get into or something. But it makes a meaningful difference for like your job prospects if you want to go into academia. Right. I actually don't. I don't know how well I would have done um, if I had properly followed through that whole process um, mm-hmm. because in, unless I did some like last minute scrounging to like build meaningful relationships, it just, I don't actually think I was as well poised as, as I could have been. Uh, mm. Yeah, so, that, that, well, I, to make you feel better, I was also in the same boat. So it, it wasn't <laughs> like I, I, well, I, I took a couple months off and then I was like, I want, I want to go to grad school. That, that would be fun. And uh, well, it, it, it's not necessarily fun, but, <laughs> but uh <laughs> no i love the creative things that you know that that people like you do where they take these difficult concepts and decide to basically communicate them effectively because it, it's 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 something that i try to uh uh sort of a philosophy that i try to adopt or a teaching pedagogy that i adopt when I'm TAing to students, uh, relaying difficult math concepts and such, um, and uh, and I, I want to tip my hat off to you, sir, for that. Um, but uh, an additional question that I'm actually mm-hmm. I was going to open up, let you ask this, but uh, yeah, yeah, but what about the teaching pedagogy? Yeah, so I guess um, Grant, what? Um, what would you what would you say is um, some an easy way? Or, or let me see if I can phrase this properly. Um, what tips do you have for someone who's trying to be um, better at teaching? What are some of the most, I guess, important? Um, what would I say? Important uh, aspects to teaching? Like, yeah. Well, I, actually, before I answer, I, I'd, I'd be curious to hear your your two answers to this. I would hate for this to be one-sided and just kind of like you ask questions that I answer, but I, I'm sure you have like great thoughts and this sounds like something you've been mulling over for years as well. So um, without leading the way, I, I will answer, but I'm, I'm curious what your, uh, your okay. take on that is. <laughs> well, I, I, I wanted to, well, I've been teaching uh, for three years now. And one thing that I run into a lot is especially with American students, if you can't tell, Terrence and I are both American students. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm sure you can tell. I'm sure you can tell. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, uh, Grant, are you are you a U.S. native student? You know, go, went to the schools here? Well, okay. Let me ask you, like, I am, but do I, do I not sound like it? Like, do I not sound American? You do. You do. But, but you... You could maybe pass for a guy who like, maybe was born in America and went no, no, somewhere else yeah. or something. Or or you could have been born somewhere else, but then you moved here really young. Mm, so, that too. Been, yeah. No, so I've been told by some people, they're like, where's your accent from? You sound like you're like one quarter British or something. I'm like, there is, I, 
I have family in the UK and such. I think what they're actually saying is that I'm kind of pretentious. Like, I think that's what that actually translates to. And it has nothing to do with like the actual sound of my voice in any way. I don't think so. <laughs> no, no, no. No, you don't give up of a pretentious vibe. You give no. off a, um, maybe I was born somewhere else and I moved to America young, like Juan was saying. Yeah. That, I am an Irish of- citizen. Uh, so that counts for something. Okay. Oh, okay. Did you spend, did you spend a lot of time back there with your relatives? Did well, you visit? I mean, a- so, yeah. Like every, every year we would go to England. My mom, she was born in Ireland and grew up in England. All her family is still there. So every year we would go to England. <laughs> not, uh, not enough to like change an accent or anything like that, but uh, <laughs> oh, you well, enough to, like, five, foster affection. Certainly. Yeah, no, but, but, <laughs> but that's important because just having an outsider view and even having a perspective of a different culture can sometimes, you know, give you some sort of contrast. Yeah. Uh, like Who knows, for, though? Well, for me, <laughs> like I'm just saying for me, it's it's some people ask me and say, hey, you don't even have an accent. My first language is Spanish. So it's mm-hmm. it's just I've assimilated so well into mm-hmm. American. <laughs> right right yeah but anyway back to the question. Course, though back to pedagogy okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah so pedagogy so you were saying one about your your students oh yeah yeah, yeah. so t- teaching them teaching them especially mathematics is is crucially difficult and, and even in my experience of teaching it uh or sorry learning it um throughout my public school education i didn't feel like it was taught well, I, I don't know how to explain it. And my task a lot of the time is to illustrate concepts so that students can grasp them easier. Typically, this is done visually, which is why I appreciate your videos so much. Sometimes I'll throw your videos up for some students to watch because they're so effective at tying these these things together that I want them to learn. So, um, But generally speaking, I guess, to answer your question before I... Uh, avoid it um, <laughs> before I give a political Yeah, we're all answer. waiting. <laughs> That's my job. <laughs> uh, I, I, my teaching philosophy is one of inclusion and generally being one-to-one, approaching the student with a sense of, I'm at the same level as you, and I want to help mm-hmm. build you up, uh, not necessarily give you the answer or anything like that. It's very Socratic. Uh, but it's also, how would you say, it's a democratic pro? Well, not a democratic process, but you get what I'm saying. It's it's a little you bit. You want of it a, to be not just you talking at them. There's a back and forth. You're reactive to how they answer things and changing yeah. what you say by it. But I also yeah. don't want to talk down to them, uh, mm. and and it takes a lot of patience for a lot of people. Patience that a lot of other teachers don't have um, mm-hmm. that I've seen. So. To to really quickly um, just say one part of my philosophy, I guess, Grant, mm. um, for you is uh, I find that trying to convey a concept to students in multiple ways. So I try mm. to say the same, this, talk about the same thing in at least three different ways to a student. Um, I think that's been very effective for being able to help students understand. So I'll have a conceptual framework of a mathematical way of a second conceptual framework way of explaining it. And I think attacking it from as many angles that I possibly can mm-hmm. usually makes things stick easier. Right. Now, I guess to turn it over to you, what do you think about um, those things? I wholly agree with what both you say. The first thing I would say is I draw a dark line between um, teaching and explanation, right? Like what I do is just explaining things. And I, I wouldn't pretend that um, it's the same as teaching in a one-on-one context or in a classroom context, and it's going to look very different, right? If I had a pile of students in front of me, I don't think the way that I would go about it is the same as the way I would go about a video of, you know, finding the best visuals and then me just kind of talking at them for 20 minutes. Um, you do want to, to Juan's point to basically not be this like stature on high and like hand things down, but like bring it out from them. Um, I, I think it's the case that the word educate shares a root with the word educe like to, to bring out, um, Mm. which is, I think a very beautiful fact because, you know, usually we think of it like we're pouring knowledge into kids' heads, but if instead the the mental image you have is like trying to evoke what's already within them, then that like really guides what you're doing. Um, so the, the teaching that I will do sometimes that's in a much more one-on-one context, um, that, that is how I try to think about it. It's, um, you know, what are the problems where if you're thinking about it, this is the problem that will um, make you come to some given insight, which means the burden of good teaching is on good 
questions, right? Finding the right questions to ask and scaffold them appropriately that gets you there. Separately, on the explanation front, which I also think is important, I maybe think the role of that should be outside the classroom, right? That like when people come to a conceptual block, like I don't know what a Fourier transform is. Okay, you need an explanation at that point. And then you can move forward with whatever you needed to know about the Fourier transform. Um, and that's where I think the internet can be helpful. The, the main philosophy that I think I'll like try to put out there that um, is, it's just weirdly hard to act on is le uh, leverage concrete examples before you talk about any of the abstract abstractions. So, uh, you know, if you're teaching algebra before talking about like the symbols and why it's true, show some numerical examples if possible. And the, the reason for doing it before is then you can like understand the power of the abstraction once it comes rather than it being, okay, I was given a definition and now I guess I see some examples of that. Um, so really trying to see like, what is the thing before we assign language and symbols on top of it? Um, and usually if you say that people nod along, they're like, yeah, yeah, of course. Like, you know, I wouldn't want to start abstract who would, but every single time that you look at a textbook or the way that someone chooses to talk about things or the way I choose to initially write things, the first instinct is to like describe the powerful general thing and then populate it with examples after. Cause I think once you understand something, that's how you think about it. You think about like, oh cool, look at this powerful general idea. Um, of like exponentiation uh, and, uh, in, in all of its like various flavors and varieties. It's such a powerful concept and then like give examples later on. Whereas what might line up better with history and then also maybe line up better with a student's potential trajectory for self-discovery is to like give these little instances and a little hint like, hmm, did you notice that like there's this similar behavior between like cosine and sine functions as there is with like how two to the X behaves. And like maybe, maybe there's some kind of thread that ties them together. Um, it's a callback to the live stream. <laughs> that, I mean, that's why it's on. That's because I'm like writing these lectures that are like trying to <laughs> spin that thread. That's why that example is coming to mind. Um, but yeah. 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 I mean, well, give yourself some credit. I think this is, this is exactly what uh, I think educators do when they try to prep a lecture or, or prep a course or something. They'll, they'll go through this process um, of putting things together and then maybe seeing how maybe you can contextualize the maybe historically or, or, or just putting little things here and there, like you're saying <clears throat> to help, you know, induce these things or help, help like kind of get the students to build uh, these ideas themselves and make the connections themselves. Uh, one question that I actually wanted to follow up with was um, what do you think? Do you, do you think this is the best way to learn math in, in, in some sense, just visually and, and obviously practicing because well, like, I, I, just just to preface this question, I was a bio major for two years, um, and approaching math was not the way I, I I didn't know how to effectively study for it. I didn't know that you actually had to practice. It was kind of like a mental sport. <laughs> <laughs> it was like you don't just absorb the fact; you have to actually, you know. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of the students that I teach they struggle with this concept, and so. Um, so yeah, I, I, I often, they often ask, what's the best way to learn this stuff? What's the best way to learn math? And I want to throw that question at you. Yeah. Well, so, I mean, obviously I put out a bunch of visuals and I often think when you want to have conceptual satisfaction around something, like having a good visual in mind can be the difference between it seeming like something arbitrarily worked and seeming like it couldn't have been any other way. Um, that might just be my own biases for being a more visual thinker. But to your point, like if you say, do you actually want to like, you want to actually know it well and be able to discover your own things? Um, you know, there is no substitute for practice. And in that context, like just building up the muscles associated with translating that visual into symbols and then translating the symbols into visuals. Like, I, I think if there's one place that I will sort of err on the channel, it's that I, um, I might like show why something's true in like the intuitive way, but then not show like how that, how that looks if you were to read it in a textbook or if you were to like go through the algebra yourself or manipulations yourself. Cause it's one thing to say, Oh, here's this very geometric picture for why, you know, the derivative of X cubed is what it is. And like why the derivative of polynomial terms in general are what they are. And it's like mm -hmm. satisfying and different and um, not the standard fare, but you should still work out the limit version of it and like see terms cancel and like make the connection like, Oh, when the term cancels here, that's what corresponds to like, a, a volume going to zero or a length going to zero over there and like really trying to draw those threads, which to Terrence's point, like 
it's coming at it from many different angles. And I think it's that those connections are in some sense more powerful than any of the individual nodes. Um, so it, like the question of what's the best way to learn math, it like has baked into it a false assumption that like a single way constitutes the best. It's uh, like the answer is find those multiple ways and then really understand the connections between them. That's the best like strategy. Um, I, I would say for learning math. Yeah, does does Khan does Khan approve this? Uh, <laughs> Salman oh, Khan. Right, no, look, look, yeah, I mean, like, look at what they do on on Khan Academy. Like, most of the usage actually doesn't come through the videos. If you consider like time spent on Khan Academy, it's actually more on the exercises. Um, and it seems like the function they serve is like you've got the exercise framework where students are practicing, and then you've got Sal's videos where they're getting like the conceptual understanding. And like that back and forth seems to be pretty healthy and like pretty successful for what they're trying to accomplish. Yeah. So, so did, I, uh, I, I, I'm I was, not letting Terrence <laughs> ask questions. But it's I was, was going to say, I, I have to admit, uh, Grant, that I thought you and Sal were the same guy for a little bit. <laughs> you know, it's hilarious. Um, <laughs> When I first started the channel, like super, super early on, I got this long email from someone who was like convinced that I was Sal and this was like the secret side project being put out. And it was this little wink that was like, it was like, I know your secret, but I won't tell it. I'm like, so he's like, he's the CEO of a decently sized organization and is also putting out a bunch of content. Like he does not have extra time. And I'm like, do you know how much time goes into these videos? Like this is not. Like a CEO side project, but oh, yeah. um, it was super funny to me. It must be because like black background teaching math right. is similar. Cause I don't think we sound that similar, but you, I, I, I thought you guys actually did sound kind of similar <laughs> and you <laughs> both are really good at teaching. So it's like putting those two together. You're like, Oh, it's gotta be the same guy. Yeah, <laughs> this there's, there's really, only one. This yeah. must've been early on for you, right? <laughs> yeah. This was like, I was like one of the first people to ever even know about three blue and brown yeah. back in the day. Like nobody, I just, yeah, that's my out, hipster claim. Check to out fame, Mr. Cool Grant. guy. I was, over uh, here. I was a, an early fan. Yeah, telling all his friends. <laughs> yeah, I know that guy. And uh, I was like, yeah, I was like, Sal's got a new channel. It's like, <laughs> <laughs> I'm like he's taking it to the next level. <laughs> no, it's so it's so funny because I, I was gonna say you mentioned Sal does this stuff in his closet. I don't know if you were joking, but but the idea of Sal doing this from his closet is like mind blowing to me. Is it, does he actually do that? Well, that he... I mean, that's how it, not anymore. He's, you know, the, oh, the yeah. proper organization. but like, uh, in, in the early days, like this was how Khan Academy started is that he literally, it was like, who would record the things from his closet where he was like wow. um, remotely tutoring his cousins and things. So, Oh yeah. Sort of an allusion to that. So you were there on the ground level of Khan no. like Oh, no, no, no. I was, I was there much later, much later. Oh, okay. How was uh, your relationship with Sal? Did I mean, you guys like the thing, contact? The thing is, by the time I, I joined, it was, you know, a more than a hundred person organization. There's like layers of management between me and him. Every interaction we had was like great and we resonated in a lot of ways. But the reality is it was just like um, very limited. Uh, mm -hmm. And I think if I had stuck around a little bit longer, there might have been a chance for that to be... Uh, a stronger connection if yeah. uh, if that was like the goal sure. does, does uh, he know that your channel exists like he's does oh, he know your... oh, okay. well I, I think that's like, why he found him I was, oh no kind well of. the talent search thing yeah, yeah sure exactly. but I'm saying now does he look does he look back and say oh we should have kept him you know or something <laughs> <laughs> what is oh, I, I don't know I, like he's no he, he he's uh, if anything he understands really well right because he at some point was someone who had like a, a very, you know, viable career path uh, in a certain direction and then like decided to do this crazy thing of like make educational videos and start this nonprofit. Um, so I, th I think if he looks at someone's like, oh, yeah, you've got like this project that you're passionate about and you want to like switch gears to it. He, he seems pretty uh, obviously understanding of that. Yeah. Um, actually, I wanted to uh, make another comment here, Grant, about or I guess a kind of a question. Um, so I was watching your Brady podcast. Um, I don't know if it was one of your first ones and you made an interesting comment about, uh, I don't know if you were kind of embarrassed by, it, but you're like, um, you said, um, he said, uh, something about everybody should be a mathematician. And you said, no, it should probably be a computer scientist. <laughs> and I was, I just 
found myself like not in agreement like yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. and i thought like, that was an interesting comment coming from you because you're you know you you were kind of like the math guy of youtube or one of the big math guys on youtube but i guess it makes sense too because you will have work with animation awesome. so much and i think i feel like i understood exactly what you were saying but i kind of wanted to give you a chance to maybe expound upon more on that statement there well okay so i think like if you're right now starting an undergrad and you don't know what you should major in um major in computer science even if you don't think you're a technical person just like major in computer science uh and for a couple of reasons like one the obvious one is career prospects are just through the roof. Uh, so like, and that, that shouldn't be taken lightly. It's like just very good to have skills that other people find valuable. Even if you're not using it to like work for someone else, the things you do for yourself will be amplified by the fact that you know how to program. Secondly, I do think it clarifies your thinking. You know, if you're in an English class and you write an essay and the prof says like, this paragraph wasn't good for this reason, um, you can have in the back of your mind the thought like, yeah, you you just didn't know what I was getting at. You don't, you don't understand like good writing when you see it. Um, when you're a computer science student and the compiler tells you like this section of code didn't work, you have to own up to it. You just have to like acknowledge that you were wrong and figure out how you were wrong. Um, and like having an environment where there's such quick feedback for that seems great. Mostly, obviously I do want a ton of people to know math and to engage deeply with math and like, sort of like pointing my life around that. I think one of the best avenues towards that is to engage deeply with programming um, because it makes clear how it's useful. The patterns of thought associated with programming are similar to the patterns of thought in math. And like, if you were going to be into math for its own sake, that's already happened. Like, I don't need to convert you, right? Um, but if that hasn't happened yet, if you don't see the spark of like, I put out this pure puzzle about coin flips and chess boards or something. And like, if you're not engaged by that because it's so weird and abstract, well, let's bring you into something that has like, uh, satisfaction associated with the real world with like powers that it's granting you and all of that um so major in major in computer science if you don't know what else to do there you go folks yeah Grant and it's, it's pretty approachable that's the thing like it, people are often intimidated if they're techie already they're kind of like in love with it but i think a lot of people who are um at least at stanford we called it like the techie fuzzy divide which seems a little bit more condescending than maybe it should be um but like if you are a fuzzy like it's going to be a little bit of a challenge to shift the way that you think if you're not super comfortable with some of the concepts, but you'll get there and like everyone does. And it's, there's a ton of resources around making it very approachable and friendly such that, um, you'll feel you know, like you'll feel great once it happens. Uh, and I think we need more people with like a very kind of, um, humanitarian design oriented, uh, default mindset, like coming into technical fields, uh, rather than it just being totally run by people who, you know, like played chess when they were kids. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's actually you, you saying you said something that kind of prompted a question in my mind about uh, you're saying the, the cool thing about com well, doing computer science, it gives you immediate feedback, this, this immediate feedback mechanism where you're like, oh, I've messed up. Um, one of the issues that I do find in learning, say, mathematics or j the just a general type of learning scheme that we have in education is you know, you turn in your homework and then you don't have feedback until maybe a week or something later or something. And, and so it, you put almost a latency between you think you have the right idea sometimes and then you can, it can be a while before you ever hear back that, oh, I messed up. And uh, it'd be so cool. It'd be cool if like, yeah, there was like some kind of learning program or something that you can kind of t toy around with and just play with these math things. I don't know if there's anything like that. Um, do you, do you know if there's like stuff out there I mean, like that? Th there are very practice oriented, like educate, like brilliant comes to mind, right. As mm -hmm. a website where it's like the way that you're learning is through doing questions and getting immediate feedback. And I think that's a good, um, dynamic Khan Academy sort of fits this bill in other ways. Um, right. Th like what you said sort of reminded me of, um, like this topology class that I took in uh, Stanford where the first time I got any kind of feedback, the first time I got the, the problem set one graded and back to me was like three days before the final. This is how oh. behind <laughs> Prof was. Brutal. Like, what an uh, example of like education gone wrong when yes. you don't hear anything about how you're doing <laughs> like three days before a final. One really annoying one with us was with our one of our instructors before who would never give us back solutions. Mm -hmm. So it's like 
<laughs> you're just constantly getting things wrong with no no feedback of correction. I was yeah. like, oh. Like, how but I get why they were holding it because they didn't want the solutions to be copied and then, you know, the next the next uh, wave of students all giving the same right. answers. But man, yeah, that was cool. The solution yeah. there is to just have like an infinite well of questions to draw upon. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But that takes creativity and time. Yeah. <laughs> With and I mean, I get it because professors have a lot of stuff to do too, yeah, so they I, can't I be They're always. They're human, you know. you know, can't blame them. But yeah. But speaking of software, um, mm -hmm. you have you have this program called Manin. Uh, Manim. Manim. Man Manim. Mm -hmm. I can't. Yeah. I'm, I'm, it, I'm I think it stands name. for I animation. only give things weird names. <laughs> <laughs> right. You named the whole channel after weird. your heterochromia for people who don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I was going to, I was going to say, um, yeah. So what, what does it stand for? You said you had an idea. Let's see if Terrence gets it right. Yeah. I think, I think it's just math animation. Yeah. Yeah. That's it. Uh, okay. <laughs> okay. <All right. laughs> yeah. No real mystery, but <laughs> I like the name. Uh, yeah, are too, you going to insert the kids cheering at that point also? <laughs> uh, <yeah>. Excited <laughs> success. <laughs> <laughs> I will. I will. I'll throw it in there for you. But yeah. uh, um, no. So you. So that takes coding in Python. What, what do you? Yeah, you program? I, I made it in Python just because that that language was home to me. Mm -hmm. Really friendly language. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a lot of the languages are friendly. I think it's just what you're familiar with. True. Um, we actually had one question from the audience. They um, they were wanted to know if you were going to be making any tutorials on um, Manim at any point. Ton of, yeah, a ton of people ask that. Uh, so the the reason that I haven't is that um, it's like changing a lot. And so up until like before January, there were just a lot of things about it that were like problematic in ways that there was low hanging fruit. I'm like, okay, I know that I would want to change this about. Um, the flexibility on the back end and then also just like what using it looks like. So I, I basically just spent a ton of time on like January and February, not even making videos, but just sort of rehashing the tool. I didn't get to where I wanted to be before I started making content again, but mm -hmm. the workflow ended up being much better, like what it is now compared to what it was then. Um, and I, I know that there's like still more that I want to change that will make the workflow even better and like faster and responsive and give you flexibility to create different kinds of visuals that you want. So it just really wouldn't make sense to like give a tutorial now on like this tool that's in a pretty intermediate step uh, mm -hmm. stage. And I get it. Like people, you know, people watch the videos and they're like, oh, I, I want to make something like that. And I would say like, there's a ton of ways that you can make animations. Um, you, there's a ton of ways you can make mathematical animations. So like Mathematica as a language is very powerful and robust and well-documented. Um, Matplotlib in Python, if you're looking for just like data uh, right. oriented stuff. GeoGebra is awesome. Desmos is awesome. Like there's a ton of places that you can turn to to get the sort of visuals that you want. Um, and I get kind of uncomfortable when I do see people, if they use Manum, that's awesome. I love it. But if I see them use it to like, you know, I have like a, a unique way to write text on the screen that was just like a, a thing that I wrote at one point because I thought that might be nice. But if the way that they're using it is basically like a slideshow, but it's just like writing text in a different way and then doing that with like lot text stuff and symbols moving around, I can't help but think like, this this is not where programmatic animation is beneficial. Like this is where you should use something like After Effects, and where you should chide me for using Manum to do that type of stuff. Where programmatic <laughs> animation is beneficial is when you have things that are naturally abstracted or like put into huge loops or something like that. So when you have, or when it's following clear mathematical rules, right? Like you have a vector field and a fluid flowing according to it. Okay, you're never going to do that in a natural way in after effects unless you're scripting in some way and if you're scripting in some way like it's just nicer to be in a programmatic environment to start with um so every now and then i do see people use it kind of in the way that it's supposed to be used which is on the kind of visuals that you could only ever do programmatically um but it's it's rare enough i guess that like that's the way i see people using it so i always get a little uncomfortable when people are like can you make a tutorial and such I'm like even when the tool is where i want it to be and i'll make that like yeah. it'll it'll be worth emphasizing somehow like that there there's lots of options for how to make what you want to make and what really matters is the lesson you want to put out and then just figure out how to put it out in the quickest dirtiest way or whatever <clears throat> tools fit your own case um like that that's where the focus should be yeah no because because i have i mean funny enough the first two programs you mentioned mathematica and i think i used the mat at least for my data analysis, I use Python. Um, okay. So, so yeah, it's just funny that some people go to you asking for for your man. Well, I think when they see these 
great animations are yeah. like, oh, Grant must have some secret, uh, some secret super <laughs> software. That's what I was thinking too. I was like, he must have these things all hashed out because how does he, you know, <laughs> how does he do it? Yeah. So uh, you know, I get some of that, right? Like, obviously, I've spent like five years, like slowly, like adding new things for each video that I make, and like. <laughs> There's, I do think there's something of value there, but I, I just also think it's going to be a kind of painful process for someone jumping right into that versus jumping right into things that are better documented and more robust. Right. So, Understandable. So, so what he's saying, folks, is that he has the alpha build and you'll never get your grimy little hands on it. <laughs> 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 no, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Uh, <laughs> no, but like some more, you know, t like going on to like some more levity stuff and more questions uh, from our audience because uh, we kind of want to get into, you know, what, what are some of your favorite math problems? What are some of your favorite? Yeah. What are some of your favorite math problems? I mean, so I feel like there's two categories. There's like just fun puzzles, right? And then there's like fundamental questions. Um, okay. I'll let you take it wherever you want to go. Uh, uh, I'll, I'll tell you about a puzzle um, just because I think it's pretty delightful. And also because I know that there will be a video on it in the not too distant future done with Matt Parker. So like That's there can be a resolution here. Um, but the classic, so it's the classic setup where you have some prisoners and a warden, and he's going to contrive some crazy circumstance that determines if they escape or if they go to the guillotine, right? Um, so there's, uh, prisoner number one walks into a room, and there's the warden there and a chessboard, and each square of the chessboard has a coin on it that's flipped either heads or tails. And to prisoner one, it just looks like a random arrangement of heads and tails on each square. Then what the warden does is he takes the key, the key to escape, and then hides it underneath one of the squares of the chessboard. So it's somehow kind of like you can hide things inside the squares of the chessboard. That's how this sure. is going to work. So prisoner one knows where the key is. Um, but he's not allowed to pull the key out. The only thing he's allowed to do is flip one of the coins on the chessboard, and only one, and then walk out of the room through a different door. Then prisoner two is supposed to walk in, look at the chessboard, which again, it's just like a seemingly random arrangement of heads and tails on all the squares, except for whatever tiny maneuver uh, prisoner one was able to do and prisoner two is supposed to deduce which square of the chessboard holds the key. Okay. So somehow prisoner one is supposed to look at the seemingly random array and make a choice of a coin. And his choice is supposed to communicate to prisoner two where the key is. Does that make sense? Yes. I'm trying to visualize it. I'm holding on by a thread. It's not a like super an visual infinite, puzzle. <laughs> it's not an infinite uh, set piece. It's not like a Hilbert space or anything. I think I just imagine I would say. No, you're just making it more complicated. <laughs> imagine <now. laughs> a simple four by four chess board or something. And uh, I, don't, okay. I don't know. For, what, what'd you so, say it's fine? Here's an example of a terrible strategy. Okay. The strategy <laughs> would go as follows. One, okay. Step one, hope that the initial state of the board was that everything is tails. Um, and then uh, wherever the key is, you flip the head above that square um, so that when prisoner two walks in, it's just the head that he just looks at whatever coin has heads and then um, that will have the key. The strategy only works one out of two to the 64 times, but it's a strategy. Right? <laughs> Your goal is to come up with a strategy that works more often than that. Oh, oh so... so um he gets to choose how the coin is flipped and where exactly it lands the prisoner well so the, sorry there's 64 coins oh okay. 64 okay mm -hmm. sorry yeah, yeah. he oh, gets to flip so when you say he flips the coin though he gets to actually choose which place it lands yeah so so yeah the word okay. flip i guess usually means like the random process with coins but what i mean is like if you if if the coin on a3 of the chessboard was flipped tails he could opt to make that and toggle it maybe i should say to heads right gotcha gotcha so you can toggle one of the coins and somehow and like loosely it first feels impossible because it's like how on earth do you specify one square by taking a random array of heads and tails and then making it look well it still looks random because you could only toggle one of them yeah on the other I'm hand, you have the answer. You should have the what? I'm assuming you have the answer. <laughs> oh, I do, I of course. Okay, good. <laughs> I was gonna say if I leave here with no answer, I'm gonna be like very a, unhappy. Like a true man. <laughs> oh, you still will be unhappy though. I have the answer, but I'm not gonna tell you. Uh oh, um, oh. <laughs> you have to wait for the video for that. Yeah, is that for the yeah. next live stream? <laughs> no, so this this is one that I did with I w went to London in February and um among other things, I filmed uh, a bit uh, with Matt Parker about this. So we're going to do kind of like a... Uh, oh, excellent. Back and forth. 
So there's a teaser then for the audience. Yeah, 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 exactly. But, but uh, this, was, this was an answer to Juan's question of like, what, what's my favorite kind of math? So I'm yeah, like, the yeah. puzzles have, I just love that stuff. Because this puzzle, what's great about it is it feels impossible. But then when you think about it, it's like, okay, I guess the decision-making power prisoner one has, he has 64 choices. Which coin do I flip? Okay. And he needs to specify one out of 64 options. So like in principle, there's something there. Um, and it's just a matter of being clever enough about how you encode information and it has a, it really has a feel of like error checking, like error yeah. correction code mm -hmm. type stuff. Where it's like, wow, you can actually um, do with a small amount of information what I would have thought takes a large amount of information. Um, so it's like kind of a transferable thing, even though yeah. it's contrived, feeling like you know coins and chessboards and whatnot. It also feels very like elegant and natural in some way. Like you're really just talking about bits. You're just talking about sixty four bits and like a, trying to flip one of them to specify another. Um, ah, and yeah, I have a feeling it has something to do with probability. Well, you, well so I'll tell you this, my first approach to this puzzle, when I heard it, um, I thought up a strategy and then I realized it wouldn't work all the time, but it would work about 75% of the time. So I'm like, no, oh, that's way better than one out of 64. So I'm feeling okay. Um, there does exist, but the problem is it would also, I say 75% of the time, if the warden put out all the coins randomly, but then if you assume yes. an adversarial warden who knows your strategy and tries to contrive the perfectly bad example for you, um, <laughs> there exists a strategy that works 100% of the time, doesn't care about an adversarial warden. Interesting, interesting, man. I can think, I can think one. of one, but I'll, I'll ask you after this. Uh, <laughs> just so I don't want to spoil anything if I get it right. So. Yeah, I guess the audience can try their hand too. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, um, I can, I'll tell you this one. Would sure. your strategy work if the chessboard had three squares instead of 64? Mm. Oh. Mm. This is maybe not fun for listeners because like, <laughs> <laughs> okay, <laughs> well, we usually to one to person who knows an answer than two person think things. about it. But. I'm going to say yes, but uh, but then maybe he's got to think it out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I'm I'm going to I'm I'm I haven't fully thought it through. So let's just say. Um, yeah, that's, so look forward to that, folks. <laughs> Three blue, one round, and um, another. But I don't one. know his 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 video might be out before uh, this podcast comes out. We'll be out. It will not be. It's going to be a while because, like, <laughs> turns out the live stream lectures like eat up a lot of my time to prep for. Well, makes yeah, actually. Makes sense. Let's go down that route. So, um, Grant, we've been enjoying. Uh, your live streams. Um, I'm glad you finally got the uh, the the rating system working. Um, I was confused by the first one. I was like, wait a minute, I, I'm not seeing how this is working. But then I saw it was it was not working properly because people had overloaded the website, of course. <laughs> and I also thought it was really funny how people were um, in, injecting um, <laughs> Jason. your web page with by overriding it to get more answers than were allowed. Oh, that was super funny. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but they were really good. I, I, I like what what made you choose um, to do a more, I guess, simpler subject than you normally do. So you did your video on quadratic, um, the quadratic equation mm -hmm. um, most recently, I believe. Well, so there's a lot of con, con, um, factors coming in confluence here that actually like made this happen. Uh, in the back of my mind, I think I've always wanted to do something that was... Um, just like pencil and paper, just noodling through uh, like worked examples. Because as much as I love the visualizations and I do think that's powerful, I also think that that's slightly misrepresentative of what doing math feels like. Um, so I wanted something that I do to feel a little bit like, okay, yeah, it's not fancy. It's not like sexy. Um, we're just going to like work through some algebra. Honestly, that's what a lot of math looks like. Um, as far as targeting high school, part of it is the stated reason of this whole like lockdown math series is like st a lot of students around are doing remote learning in some capacity. And I want to like offer a resource that, you know, it's not going to replace a class by any means, but hopefully this is something that some teachers find helpful. They can point their students towards. So like helping high school students. Um, but also playing into that is it's just, uh, I'm tired of any time I like give a talk and I'm talking to someone who's like a parent afterwards and they're like, Oh, I like your videos, but can you ever make things that are like, could you just do something that's more approachable for like kids or helpful in school? <laughs> and I'm tired of not having any answers. Um, <laughs> and like the best answer for them would be if I had some like elementary school stuff that they could point their kids to, but like maybe a middle ground is to just like be a little bit comfortable saying, yeah, okay. I know a lot of the existing audience, you know, maybe they're not, they didn't subscribe to the channel because they want to learn about the quadratic formula. I get that. I'm aware. Um, <laughs> but one, 
we often don't know things as well as we think we do. So like, even if you think you know about some of this stuff, like there is actually different insights to be gleaned. But then two, I want to reach a different kind of audience for this particular like sequence. That's not like how the entire channel is turning by any means, but it's just, um, I think it's important to like, let yourself try different things. Um, and I figured changing up the style completely where like it's live and on camera and like pencil and paper, like hopefully that does enough of like branding signaling to say like, this is different. This is obviously like not the usual three blue and brown fair. If you're into it, awesome. If you're not like, don't worry, usual content is still coming. Um, yeah, that's sort of, yeah, yeah. I, I thought it was really good. Um, and actually I did learn a new thing from that. Um, the simplified, uh, quadratic equation I never have seen before. And, uh, I thought that was really cool. Yeah. Apparently it, it's something that, um, uh, people outside the U S have known about something yeah, like, evidently like, Oh, well, okay. so, I mean, it's not like new math, but evidently it's, it's something that in like Germany and Austria, um, they'll be taught something called the PQ formula, which is of a similar flavor. The point of the lecture was less about the formula though, and more about like the, like how to read it and give it meaningful terms and like how you could discover it yourself. Um, and I, I'm a little bit skeptical that even in like the German and Austrian schools, that it's not just taught like, here's the formula for how to solve quadratics rather than like, here's the patterns that it connects to, uh, relevant for other kinds of problem solving you might do. Yeah, I think you're definitely right. And yeah. I, I did learn something from it. I've never thought of it as like looking at the midpoint to the roots and I was like, that's brilliant. Yeah. So that yeah. Is, well, that's, uh, that's what I like to call deep algebra as, uh, <laughs> well, they make fun of me because, uh, I, I, well, we had this one, uh, <laughs> Grant would be disappointed. Let's just you. say, <laughs> let's just say that uh, in my first year, I was really rusty here in grads back in, back into grad school, and uh, and I encountered some algebra that was really silly. <laughs> let's was, just say, hold on, don't tell me okay. exactly what it was, but I'll just say I won't embarrass you. I called it deep algebra. <laughs> But it was basically just like, you know, you're factoring stuff out and stuff mm -hmm. and power stuff. But you're totally right. There's there's a lot of hubris uh, about approaching different um, – some of these algebra concepts. Like I didn't even know how to properly take – what is that formula where you can basically take a uh, quadratic and then you solve for the uh, – basically you find the, uh, the missing um, portions of that quadratic. Is this like an official name for this? Mm hmm? I don't remember. I don't what do you mean? I don't either. There's like constants that you basically fill in the square in a sense. Oh, completing the square. Completing the square, thank okay. you. Yeah, filling like the a, square. Yeah, you see what I'm saying? <laughs> so, <laughs> so yeah, the there were things that that I was like, wow, okay, that's a cool trick. I didn't know there was a generalized formula to this. Um, well, actually, um, Grant's live stream kind of went into that a little bit too, no, because yeah. um, you were showing Grant how you know, the B portion of AX squared plus BX plus C mm -hmm. is just the, um, the addition of the, of the two, uh, um, constants. And then you have the C portion was just the multiplication of the two constants. And I guess that's definitely related to the completing the square. Yeah. No, it's just funny. Cause I, I didn't, and I how you like, derive the quadratic yeah. formula actually at all pretty much. Yeah. It's like, Oh, you, you see it so much. I'm like, Oh, there's a generalized form. Okay. That's cool. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, just so to, you know, be a little for you listeners out there who think they figured it all out. Yeah. You, know. you can always go back. Right. Grant. <laughs> that's, I mean, that's, yeah. Like I, I'm sort of trying to walk two lines with these particular lectures where on the one hand I want to genuinely teach, like if it was a high school student, who's not usually a math fan. I want it to be helpful to them and like approachable. Um, but I also know that a lot of the existing audience will like curiously like snoop in and be like, what's going on here? And I want there to be something new for them. Um, which, which is actually a fun exercise in trying to look back to high school topics and say like, what's interesting here? Like what's not obvious about, um, what's going on here. Uh, and that's actually like very fun to look back at I don't know, like trigonometry was the last one that I did. And I, I, I was pretty angstful actually in trying to prep for it because I'm like, okay, I could just tr teach trig normally. But like, what's, what's a non-obvious fact that we can highlight here that's like extremely approachable, but at the same time gives a wink and a nod to like deeper math. Um, yes, and that's right. You that's, did have the uh, trigonometry live stream too recently, right? So. Yeah, yeah. That, I mean, I, I've only done two. Yeah, I'm, I'm a novice at this. Yeah. Well, yeah, that one was real smooth. That was the one where they were uh, doing the, the funny. The stuff. question system actually worked. <laughs> the the live yeah, dynamic yeah. worked. I guess yeah. did it not work for the um, quadratic one? I can't remember now. Well, so okay, basically, 
there's a couple of things happening. One, um, what they're actually building is a product that's meant to be like much deeper than like this live quiz dynamic. So yes. there's the way that you would implement it if that's all that you wanted. And then there's the way that you would implement it, implement it if you want like a more powerful system for other use cases associated with assessment. Um, but I guess there were just some like some issues associated with whatever AWS defaults there were that made it such that it, it, it didn't scale the way that things should always theoretically scale. And with most products, right, like when you first make it, you don't go from like zero to 15,000 in 10 seconds. Like you have like a slower ramp up of how many people are like on the system at once. So as soon as it was like the live stream started and there was like everyone hitting it at once, it just like exposed something. But it started working by the end of that lecture not for any of what it was meant for, which is, uh, you know, guiding the lesson based on meaningful questions asked. But we just did it for some like silly warm up polling questions about like your relationship yes. with the quadratic formula and stuff. <laughs> so it made for like a, a quirky, just wind down to the whole lesson, which yeah. was actually kind of nice. Yeah, well, very nice. Well, I was going to add that you said you basically said that you do these live streams to show people that, you know, math isn't necessarily the sex, the sexy thing that you kind of prepare. But I want to say, look at these models. These models are beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> Bad uh, jokes all day. <laughs> no, but 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 in all seriousness, speaking of models, right. Um, did you have you kind of looked at uh, Wolfram's new theory mm. yet? Uh, not not yet. Um, no, I've, yeah. I've heard some people. Some, I've I actually heard him talking a little bit about what he wanted to do um, in terms of like setting a framework. So I, I don't know anything about it. The last I heard, um, he was saying he wanted to like um, set out a game of life type scenario and like mm. describe what constraints are going to correspond with rules of physics that we know and try to find the rules analogous to rules for game of life that would correspond to this which like is a very super different way of going about things um i like i, I don't i'm not well versed enough in physics to like speak to the legitimacy of that or not but i i don't know i have, I have some op opinions about wolfram that we can maybe go into if you want or not of course but, yeah let's do it <laughs> well so i think like i think one of the best quotes that i ever heard it was like in this article about him uh that was like stephen wolfram's work like speaks for itself if only he would let it and I think sometimes in his writing or when, when I'll talk, like he, it, it's a it's a heavy pill to swallow because it's like it comes off that he's just really full of himself, um, and uh, like we just really react badly to that as readers. It's like such an off putting quality for someone to have to like really think that they're the top of the world. Um, but I think if you do like set that aside, um, and I haven't read a ton of his stuff, but the limited I have, like. If you set that aside that fact and it's sort of a heavy pill to swallow that, okay, yeah, it's a little bit on the arrogant side. Like, it's interesting. It's definitely clearly intelligent and like a, a different way of thinking about the world that's much more computationally focused than a lot of others. And I, I do love the idea of people thinking about things extremely differently, like being bold enough to like try something big. Um, so I'm not at all in a position to say like, yeah, no, he clearly has a theory of everything for physics. Um, mm -hmm. But I, I could imagine a lot of people might have this knee jerk reaction to like be a little bit dismissive of it because of this personality trait. And because, you know, anytime someone says like they have a big theory, you should be skeptical of it. Um, mm -hmm. But I don't know, I'd be curious what, um, even if it, you know, doesn't pan up to the like image that he seems to have painted, like I'd be curious what nuggets of gold there are like lurking within there. Yeah. Have you have you grasped with this or have you wrestled with this question amongst like and I know in undergrad we kind of have these discussions a lot as physicists but uh, do you do you kind of approach I mean I imagine maybe you guys in the math department have questions like this like what is the universe is it is this a lot of the approach is simulation versus kind of like uh, well cyclical kind of thing but what what's your kind of general take on it if if so I mean. I, I don't feel well enough first to answer to that because the reality is I actually like don't know a ton of physics. Um, probably know as much as you might expect from a given like math major uh, and such. Um, it's all I'm trying to like learn more about physics. What? It's all differential equations, man. You, you, but it's not is the thing. Like it's really not. Like even if, even if solving the problems, um, especially yeah. associated with like classic dynamics or something like that, plays out in that way. Um, or even if you say like all quantum mechanics is is like linear algebra with complex numbers. It's like, okay, on the one hand, yes, that is the math that's going into it and like where the rules you need to learn come from. And honestly, where a lot of the conceptual hurdles come from. So if you wrap your mind around linear algebra and then the harder 
component of it, which is linear algebra with complex values, then like you're you're a big part of the way there. But on the other yeah. hand, there's a whole other component of like your relationship with experiment and the right kind of inquiry to ask um, and how to interpret the results that you see. And I, I like I I think a lot of people often you'll hear them talk about visualizations or like ways to conceptualize the math of physics as if that is the universe, right? Um, or they'll say like, what, what a particle is, is such and such. It's like, well, right. well, no, that's the math. That's like a model for what the particle is. Like what the particle is, is inaccessible. Uh, this might just me being naive, but that's how I think about things. Like what the particle is in and of itself, like that's inaccessible. All we have are observations and models. And it's awesome that you've come up with a beautiful way to visualize the model, but like, don't yeah. talk about it. Like that's what the universe is because that's not something we have access to. Oh, we, to we totally agree. That, that trouble really comes in when it comes to quantum mechanics. Yeah, well, I, I totally um, agree with you on this because it, it's it, it, there's a lot of people that talk about you know superposition. This is a concept that uh, leaves a lot of physicists scratching their heads. And right. uh, you know, is a particle really in a linear combination of states? Like, is that really what you see? You know, and then uh, some people take the of course kind of approach. Um, but of but then like you know, I'm like, well, we don't really know what's going on because we're, we're this is a model based on it, empirically that describes what happens and, and it works, but it doesn't mm -hmm. mean it's necessarily what it is. But mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. anyway, uh, yeah, but yeah, so, uh, I, I kind of wanted to ask just for some listeners and we're, and we're some, closing some in your, on the, uh, 56 minute, minute yeah, mark some, here. But some of your big fans, you know, um, Maybe like what are you, what are your hobbies? What do you like to do? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Let's hear a little bit of the um, the uh, Grant's hobbies side, the yeah, non-math yeah. Grant. Besides making <laughs> YouTube videos, you know, for fun, because these this is this is and, a e hobby and even us. if you have a lot of stuff going on now, what maybe were your hobbies as a kid? Besides sure. math. Um, well, I mean, as a kid, music was a big part of my life. Um, I played violin and then started like dabbling in other instruments, and that remains today. I. I don't play violin as much mainly because like I live in an apartment and a violin is a very loud instrument and I'm always self-conscious, but I do like these days I've been noodling around much more on like guitar and piano and that's kind of my like wind down activity. Um, I love to run. Um, I, I was getting into climbing and then a pandemic hit and I can't go to the <laughs> climbing gym anymore. <laughs> Oops. Yeah, I actually got, I same, I, I legitimately got certified to belay maybe a, two weeks before. <laughs> that sucks so much. Yeah. <laughs> Cause it's like right when you're in the honeymoon period and you're like, wow, I like humans love to like escalate things. Yeah. Right. <laughs> and it's, it's going to feel the greatest at that point. And then like, I guess you can't now. I was like, I'm like, yeah, I'm like, I'm going to forget how to belay once this whole thing is over. And I'm like, oh, great. <laughs> Grant, I wanted to just say, um, I'm also a violinist. Um, oh, cool. What was the last piece that you played? Oh, man. Like classical piece. Properly. Yeah. Um, so do you know the, do you know the Mendelssohn one that's like super famous? Like, dun, 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 yeah. dun, 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 not that one, but the third movement of that one that's much lesser known. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> Very nice. nice. No, one, no one's going to know, but they'll, they'll look it up and it's like, it's a very, very fun violin piece. Yeah. Oh, you're good. <laughs> yeah, you guys should have a, should have a violin off. <laughs> one of, I mean, one of my favorite ones that I remember playing, like as a classical solo piece. Did you ever do a like Symphony Espanol by Lalo? Yeah, uh, I never played it, but I know of it. It's like, oh, it's just so fun. It's yeah. yeah. <laughs> Is that one that you've been also that you also played around that time? Yeah, Besides yeah, around the same time. On the Mendelssohn. Okay, yeah, yeah. very nice. Did you actually um, do any of that like uh, for school at all at any period of your life? What, what do you mean, like classes? Well, I could just play in the school orchestra oh, um, well, of in college, I mean. So, yeah, I mean, basically college is the time that I stopped, like, doing official stuff with the violin. So I, I did, like, youth orchestras all throughout before then. So, um, like, in Utah, there was something called, like, the Utah Youth Symphony and, like, an all-state orchestra and such. Um, so I was, I was into that. But then... Um, College, I would basically just jam with friends. That was my musical capacity. Is that it would be like, oh, this friend like plays jazz piano. I'm like, hey, let's let's jam sometime, right? Mm -hmm. um, or others with like guitar or whatever else. And it it became much less classical and much more like improvisational, um, and much less frequent. Also, <laughs> importantly, <laughs> um, but 
never never in the school orchestra at that point because other things happened and again it was kind of the like i don't know maybe feeling too shy to practice in a dorm right mm -hmm. well just yeah, also the time crunch of undergrad is just huge yeah, yeah. Right. yeah. so yeah, it's interesting. We we were we actually had talked to a uh, Mithana Yoganathan, who's um, oh, in the I just got off the phone with her before this call. Oh no way! <laughs> <laughs> she was she made the comment how a lot of um, physicists, mathematicians are all very musical, um, yeah. Yeah. and yeah, I guess it rings true once again. Yeah, once again, yeah, because uh, I have a guitar, play drums for fun. Um, I don't play violin. Do you, do you have any theories on why that's true? Hmm. <laughs> Okay, do you have one? Because I, I, I'm going to think little, about it. A little. So, I mean, I had this student who I would like do some one-on-one -on -one teaching with, um, and he was, he was very talented at math, clearly. Um, and then he also started picking up music and played like violin and bass and such. Um, and I remember at some point, just when I was talking to him about it, he said, like, my life is patterns, man. My life is patterns. <laughs> like, that's an interesting way to put it. The, the, the relationship he had with math was very centered around, like, seeing certain patterns and kind of abstracting them away into... You know, you're looking at some hard problem to solve. And rather than working through a bunch of things, you recognize a pattern that sort of clumps it all together. And I think that comes up in music a lot, too, where you might have like a guitar riff or like a violin riff that seems very complicated. Like there's a lot of moving parts in it. Um, but if it's something that's kind of come up in various different forms, and if you understand like the chord structure of the music in the right way, you're able to kind of come at it. And it, it just fits a pattern that you've seen before rather than thinking of it as individual notes. So my suspicion is that the people who engaged with math earlier on or engaged with music earlier on and started to have this realization that even when it looks like it's about the individual parts, what's actually going on in the brain is a, like a, a broader view picture of what the different structures are and how they piece together. Um, that that just like probably sits in the same part of the brain somehow. And so when one of them is being strengthened, it just like auto strengthens it for the other. And then people like to do what they feel good at. So if you like, you come and you start playing music and you like, you feel like you have a natural aptitude for it. When in reality, what's happening is it's like, you have this appreciation for a specific kind of abstraction that no one ever puts words to. Then you like self identify as being like musically talented and then you kind of keep pursuing it. And then because you're practicing it, then you get better. And then the positive cycle continues. Yeah. Yeah. I think there's definitely something to that theory. There's a correlation for sure. And I also, just to, to note, I felt much more comfortable with mathematics, to be honest, for a mm. very long time, more so than physics. Mm. And I felt physics was more forced. And I think that's because um, there's a different aspect of physics where you actually have to figure out how to simplify problems. Um, you're, you're basically fitting a simplified model to a complex potentially complex real life system you're saying the and empiricism, that doesn't, right? that's not all, that's not tip, that's not really the same thing as like mathematics where the rules of logic are very clear and the patterns are very clear and it it always seems to work in this well, very formulaic well, way also math is just way more creative because it i mean you, physics is just math with bounds right you put you put boundary conditions on a lot of things um just, yeah but it's a little bit different from what i'm my oh, point okay. is here though okay. it's it's more of um the math is very clear. It's very clear. Um, where the physics for me at the time was not so much. Mm. Um, but yeah, I felt, I almost felt like, oh, I should maybe go into math instead of physics for a long time. And then I was like, oh, okay, I'm just going to stick with physics and go with it because it's the real world. Do you think that happens to a lot of physicists? Like, it seems like a lot that I read about, they like were deeply in love with math. And then they had this turning point of realizing like, I'm not sure I feel comfortable with like the, where the mathematicians have gone with this, but the, the the love of math that they had then got transferred into like pursuing physics. Do you think that's yeah, common or? I don't know if it's common, but I've definitely known several physicists who switch or who have switched over to math. Yeah. Um, and then I also know physicists who are like, um, at least for me, it was more of, I need to actually make sure I stay within the real world. With math, mm. it's very alluring to go off the deep end and to just go straight, you know, I'm just going to make my own universes. I'm just going to make my own rules. Um, whereas with physics, it forced me to actually put myself in the real world and try to make real progress in, in real life. Not saying that mathematicians don't do real progress, but there's an allure to living in that realm of anything can happen in your universe that you create. Yeah, no, the, 
they're, they're not facing the same constraints often. And it's, it's easier to like publish papers about something without having to justify its connection. And it's like, everyone is sort of leaning on the fact that the mathematician instinct for what is beautiful, like has a weird correlation with what is useful. And it's like, this seems to be true through a lot of history. We're not entirely sure why, but you guys just keep doing whatever you seem to want to do because that's strangely useful in ways that we're not able to predict. Right. Um, exactly. I have a suspicion that there's probably there's a survivorship bias and like a lot of math is genuinely useless, but we just we don't talk about that math. Um, <laughs> but enough of it pops out in unexpected ways that we're like, okay, that even even if you seem unconstrained by reality, like we're going to let you off the leash, you silly math department, you and uh, <laughs> you just tell us what you come back with. Yeah, until it's useful. Like there's a, the, I guess I did have an appreciation for math. Um, it's in 105. Um, I, well, it was more mostly out of just, I re, was already approaching physics and saying, wow, math is so deep and I could definitely go into this much more. And, and I read this book about Fermat's last theorem and uh, the journey of the, I'm going to, I don't remember Andrew the guy's. Wiles. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Uh, I didn't want to butcher his name, <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, and I, the whole process of him figuring it out and having developed the math and, and then discovering that, well, the math was kind of there. I think, I guess some inkling, correct me if I'm wrong. There were some concepts that were developed early on and it, they weren't necessary until I guess they were trying to prove this theorem. Um, well, I mean, it was all it was all state of the art at the time that he was proving it, right? It was um, it it was this like connection between two very seemingly different fields that mm -hmm. themselves were like very active areas of research. So in that case, it wasn't like something that had existed a while and was lurking, but it was built on top of like quite the foundation of um, other things. And mm -hmm. he was just like, in some sense, providing the final brick. But it was a very it was very heavy brick because of like oh, the connection yeah. that needed to be drawn. Um, yeah. No, but even yeah, then, it's, it's like, if the end result is like Fermat's last theorem, it's like, does that count as useful? I don't know. Do you, do you care about integer solutions to X to the N plus Y to the N equals Z to the N? Like, we're not in, <laughs> we're not in the realm of useful yet. No, no, but it's cool. <laughs> but <laughs> but no, a lot of the math behind that, right, that right. like it's, sits on that tower that like went into Andrew Wiles' proof includes things like elliptic curves, right? And then elliptic curves are a universal enough thing that like they're used throughout cryptography right now. So like, they've proven their worth through and through. Um, and if what it took for mathematicians to start thinking about elliptic curves seriously in a discrete context was something like Fermat's last theorem, then all right, well done. We're glad we let you off your leash. Even if yeah. like the bone that you came back with of X to the N plus Y to the N equals Z to the N is not one that we care about. Um, like the other things that came along with it, I yeah. guess we're okay with. Do you think Fermat was lying <laughs> when he wrote well, on the margins? Well, I mean, Probably. So, the, the, I, th I think everyone probably agrees that he did not have a proof. I think <laughs> yeah. that everyone will agree. The question is, was he lying? Or did he like actually have a proof to the case for n equals 3 and just like think that it applied more generally, not understanding that there is a hugely qualitative difference between Fermat's last theorem for n equals 3 versus for like higher powers of n? Yeah. Well, yeah. He, well, I think he probably assumed that it was something easy he could just come back to. He was probably real tired one day. <laughs> I just got done doing a bunch of stuff and was like, he's like a, this seems provable, but I'm too tired to work on this. No, I'll just he, prove it tomorrow. No, he was just like, <laughs> the candle wick's running out. He's just like, ah, I could write the rest of it, but it just doesn't fit on these margins. So uh, anyway, you guys will figure it out. But yeah, yeah I think we should wrap it up here once. So uh, Grant, yeah, it was great having you, man. Um, uh, I guess... To close out, there's one mystery I need to figure out about you here. <laughs> what is your age? Because you look oh like my. somebody who's like between 28 and 38, and I cannot pinpoint <laughs> this what guy. exactly your age oh. is. Yeah, no, it's, uh, I'm 65. Um, <laughs> <laughs> drink a lot of water, wake up early, you know. Stay hydrated. <laughs> yeah, that's good. Yeah. I'm the same thing. Ter Terrence, a lot of people question my age. like, you're so agely ambiguous. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, uh, let's leave it that way. I think I'm happy with that. Uh, now, Terrence, though, Terrence leans on the, um, I want the, you know. Yeah, this, wants, this hair ain't helping. He wants to appear like uh, a, a philosopher, like a Greek philosopher. <laughs> well, he you leans, do look like a philosopher. 
You do Good. seem like you have a lot of wisdom uh, hidden behind <laughs> those you. eyes. It's all a beard. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but he leans into it, though, which is kind of like, all right, all right. Yeah. But, you, yeah. but you're not going to tell us, Grant? Is that a mystery? <laughs> you don't have to uh, no, let, let's see. How old am I? Um, I you don't have to answer. 27. 27. Yeah. 37? 27. 27. 27. Okay. Uh-huh. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Excellent. Excellent. Yes. Finally m- cracked the mystery. <laughs> he's trying to dox you, Grant. That's what he's trying to do. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. But anyway, a yeah. couple other questions. Yeah. What was the, what was the name of the street that you grew up on? Just out of curiosity, <laughs> is there anything interest? Any interesting stories behind yeah. that, or like the first pet you had? <laughs> <laughs> what was the co- first car you drove? Uh, you know, what's your favorite color? Um, you know, all those kind of things. Uh, <laughs> well, anyway. Are there any security questions that rely on, like, you forgot your password says, what's your favorite color? <laughs> like, blue. And then it gives you access. You're like, I don't feel good about this system at all. Yeah. Well, I hope your security question isn't actually three blue, one brown. Like, if that, that would be funny. If you're like, favorite color. Uh, no, but anyway, uh, Grant, thank you so much. We don't yeah. want to take up too much of your time, but uh, it was so much fun. Yeah. And just uh, for the audience, guys, once again, I know you guys probably are here from Grant's channel, so <laughs> this won't be any mystery, but check out 3Blue1Brown. Th- also, check out the website, 3Blue1Brown.com. And then also, guys, tune in for his live streams. Grant, how often are you going to have the live streams? For the next couple of weeks, we'll be doing like Tuesdays and Fridays. Okay. Yeah. And did you did you want to plug anything else? Maybe like... A, yeah, any like new projects? Or socials or something? Oh no, that's that's all good. You guys, you guys have been very generous with the cool. you know, promotion at the end here. Alrighty, alrighty, guys. Grant, thank you again, and we'll sure. see you guys next time. Yeah, see you Sounds guys. Good.